uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and uh, good morning to my friends from the european countries i am uh, major general pradeep goswami deputy director united service institution of india and on behalf of uh, general bk sharma director united service institution of india and nupi and sipri uh, we welcome you all to today's webinar uh, today's web webinar is co-hosted by usi nupi and sipri before i proceed further let me uh, say a few words about these three famous and old institutions usi was established in 1870 and it, today it is a 151 year old uh, autonomous think tank and one of the oldest think tank our focus basically is the research related to national security issues military history and conflict studies including un peace operation and a distant learning program for the indian armed forces officers nupi was established in 1959 with a focus on the research and disseminating information relating to security and risk growth and development and international order and governance sipri established in 1966 and provides uh, data analysis and recommendation for armed conflicts military expenditure and arms trade as well as disarmament and arms control this year usi is conducting series of uh, webinars or seminars if the situation permits on the un related issues inaugural uh, webinar was conducted on 27th february 21 and theme was india and un peace operations principles of un peacekeeping and mandate and today is the second webinar with the theme the impact of climate change on un peacekeeping operations this webinar is against the backdrop because the un peace operations or the special political missions are tasked by the security council to consider and respond to the climate related security risk to, to put across in a very simplified way any intervention in the complex system such as human society reactions will vary and will have multiple effects some of these effects are intended and planned but others may be unintended similarly the traditional peace officials are focused on their intended consequences but some researchers and practitioners have drawn attention to the fact that the peace operations can also generate unintended consequences like adding to the climate change this issue will be addressed by the speakers in today's webinar for this we are very fortunate to have today the few practitioners of the un professional and the uh, practitioners who are participating and will be sharing their thoughts on the climate related security risk current challenges and how it impacts un peace operations to start the session we have general bk sharma director united service institution of india he was a un military observer in the central america india's defense strategy in the central asia commanded a division on the chinese border and has been the senior faculty member of the national defense college new delhi he specializes in the strategic net assessment and scenario gaming now i invite janan sharma for the opening remarks uh, thank you pradeep uh, and uh, a very warm welcome and good afternoon to all the indian and foreign participants for this very important webinar on a topical issue which has the direct implications for humanitarian security uh, and we are very happy to partner with the nupi and sipri with which we have series of other events as also and i had an opportunity to visit sipri and present papers there as and we are particularly happy that uh, we being supported by the high level dignitaries uh, from the un from new york as well as from delhi i am thankful to dr sidrik to have taken this initiative and general goswami both having put together this this event for the day uh, now a special thanks sir to miss rania dagesh uh, kamara who is the chief of policy and best practices service with the undpo 
and she has a wealth of experience on this this issue and variety of other issues she has been a global broader and i think she will bring lot of uh, value to this today's discussion also with us today we have uh, ms uh, renata lock distelian uh, who is the un resident coordinator based in delhi and she also i was seeing her profile she has a very rich profile and i think that she has a lot to say and we have to a lot to imbibe from her uh, we also thankful to other panelists like dr florian from uh, rusi and uh, dr manish srivastava from teri which is a preeminent think tank in india dealing with energy and resources and also of course uh, general botlai uh, who has uh, been instrumental in guiding us and we also have Uh, our chief instructor here general astana who has been participating in series of uh, these events now a few words about the un uh, uh, about the usi uh, general goswami has already narrated about usi but i would like to focus a bit more on the contribution of usi in the un peacekeeping operation in fact we are the pioneer in this field here and uh, we had set up uh, under the leadership of general nambiar the center for un peacekeeping which worked with us for nearly 12 years and now that has been adopted as a permanent unit of the indian army we are also the founder members of the challenges forum epon uh, we've had interaction with hota panel uh, we also participated in number of events with the responsibility to protect under the aegis of our ministry of external affairs uh we have hosted a number of uh, un peacekeeping related uh, international conferences workshops uh, conducted series of courses at the uni at the usi including with the help of unitar and one of particular importance here is the protection of women in the conflict zone we were also very fortunate among a number of dignitaries to host mr kofi annan are uh, to speak at our institution uh, our institution has published a number of books and monographs on the subject and we have a very rich resource faculty some of our journal officers have been the heads of missions in some of the most difficult uh, areas in the world uh, we have a membership of about 16000 uh, serving officers and uh, retired officers from diplomats of which uh, there are a large number of people who have been united nation military observers and they not only include, include military men but also from the police and other other domains and as we know that we are the second largest contributor uh, in the un peacekeeping operation therefore we become a very important stakeholder and we know today that uh, uh, what covid has done to the world and what impact the climate change is going to have and therefore i think it's a very timely uh, uh kind of a decision for us to start uh, brooding and mulling over these very very critical issues and now that the world is bracing for this uh, un summit which is under the aegis of mr biden and security council has also taken note of the importance of climate change it is high time that we start putting our heads together and start reflecting on the issues how they affect some of these uh, you know the mission areas the people who are uh, residing in those mission areas and the people who have been contributing forces so without much ado i don't want to get into too many technicalities and i'll hand over back to general goswami to take us through the proceedings and look forward to very invigorating and a very very in good session today thank you jalan sharma now i'll request dr cedric who is a research uh, professor with the nupi and presently working on a project with dr florian of cipri to generate uh, some actionable information on climate peace and security risk on the un security council agenda over to dr cedric for his remarks Thank you very much uh, General Goswami and uh, General Sharma. Um it's my absolute pleasure to to uh 
welcome everyone, both uh, our, our participants that are with us in the Zoom call, as well as our international participants that are joining us via our live stream via, via YouTube to, uh, to welcome you all to this seminar. Uh, I especially appreciate the co collaboration with uh, USI India. Uh, I think it's more than 10 years now that we've been working together in challenges in the uh, effectiveness of peace operations network. And, and before that, we worked together on projects related to rising powers and peace building and the peace capacities network. And, and before that, even the civilian capacities network. And of course, it's a uh, very fitting that we have this seminar with uh, our colleagues in India uh, who have such a long and proud association with peacekeeping. Um, India, one of the most consistent and largest troop contributing countries, and also the country that has made the, the highest uh, sacrifice in the name of peace than any other country. So uh, very appropriate that we start this uh, series of seminars on the impact of climate change on peace operations with a reflection on the Indian experience uh, and also Indian perspectives on climate change and peace operations. And Norway has been involved with uh, peacekeeping from its beginning. And NUPI has had a focus on peacekeeping since its inception in 1959. And over the last 15 years uh, that I've been with NUPI, we have researched and accompanied various aspects of peace operations, including the development of the capstone doctrine and subsequent initiatives such as the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative and related to protection of civilians. We've also worked with the UN's Department of Peace Operations on the design and implementation of the Comprehensive Performance Assessment System or CPAS for UN peace operations. And NUPI also serves as the Secretariat for the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network, EAPON. So when our attention turned to the effects that climate change has on peace and security, it was natural for us to think uh, about how climate change impacts on peace operations. And to do that, we turned to the Stockholm Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, who has also been at the forefront on research and on peace and security issues since 1966. And CIPRI has been working in the area of climate related peace and security risks for many years, including especially uh, the attention this topic has received by the UN Security Council. So our current interest in this topic is informed by Norway's role as an elected member of the Security Council in 2021 and 2022, alongside India. And the effects of climate change on peace and security is one of the four priorities for Norway during its time on the Council, alongside peace, diplomacy, women, peace and security and protection. And Nupian Cipri is supporting Norway during its period on the Security Council by producing a series of fact sheets on the effects of climate change on specific countries on the agenda of the Security Council. We have looked so far at Somalia and South Sudan, and we are currently working on Sahel and Mali. And we will also cover countries like Afghanistan, the Central African Republic, the Democrat Democratic Republic of Congo and Sudan. And as you can see, many of these countries are also countries where the UN has deployed peace operations and where India has contributed to police and, and troops. In this context, we are also launching today a series of dialogues in different parts of the world to see how different members of the Security Council and different troop and police contributing countries are experiencing and perceiving the impact of climate change on peace operations. And we are very happy that our first seminar is done in partnership with our longstanding friends and collaborators in India. So thank you very much to, to USI India for the collaboration. And thank you to all the participants, both those on Zoom and those following this event on YouTube for your interest and engagement. Thank you very much. Back to you, General Goswami. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cedric. Now I'll request uh, Ms. Renata Locke, the UN representative coordinator in the India she has served with the United Nations for the last 35 years in many countries in Africa and Asia. Now I'll request her for her remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. General Goswami. Can you hear me all right? Is my voice coming through? Yes. Very good. Okay, thank you. Lovely to meet you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, uh, wherever you may be. Um, I'm really delighted to join this 
I would say, very timely conversation three years after the launch of the Action for Peacekeeping in Initiative. UN peace peacekeeping, as you know very well, has never been easy and striving to keep it attuned uh, to the evolving and increasingly complex landscapes of threats like climate change is also not easy. I think the first step forward um, really is this kind of conversation because while security risks and climate change are now fairly well understood separately, there are still many angles and many views on their interlinkages and there's not yet a clear consensus yet on its opera operationalization. I'd like to start by warmly thanking USI, NUPI, and CIPRI for organizing this conversation and express my appreciation for the distinguished speakers who will be sharing their insights from main, mainly from the ground, uh, who, have lead, who have led uh, peacekeeping operations in complex environments, and also at the intersection of climate change and humanitarian emergencies. I think we'd all agree that climate change and environmental crises increase the risk of violent conflict. They exacerbate tensions, for example, over scarce resources. They often lead to migration and displacement. They widen inequalities, snatching livelihoods from vulnerable communities. And they bring about diminishing capacity of national and local governments to maintain security. And when combined with weak governance and low resilience, the additional stress of climate change can, in certain circumstances, lead to violence, which can spiral into violent conflicts, civil wars, and local or regional humanitarian emergencies. Most of the complex conflicts in our times, Afghanistan, Mali, South Sudan, are home to peacekeeping missions that are among the most exposed to climate risks. According to Dr. Krampe's seminal report to CIPRI, six out of the United Nations' 10 biggest peace operations are in countries that are most exposed to climate change. In fact, the impacts of climate change on UN peacekeeping is not new. The UN Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali in 2018 became the first peacekeeping mission to have environmental factors explicit in its mandate. Land degradation and other environmental factors have also been part of the Security Council resolutions on Somalia and Lake Chad. Peacekeeping in the Central African Republic have helped address resource conflicts, an example or an excellent example, example even of how a better understanding of the climate crisis gives peacekeeping new tools to work with. Smaller groupings of states have also come together, including Friends on Climate and Security, which includes both P5 members like France and important troop contributing countries like Bangladesh. The history of UN peacekeeping has been a story of evolving mandates. Keeping peace operations future ready is not just a logistical or technological question. Peacekeeping evolved when wars created humanitarian crises, necessitating the protection of aid convoys, rebuilding roads, helping children lay down guns, and ensure safe elections. It evolved when conflicts moved from organized factions to non-state actors, communities, militia. It evolved to better perform intelligence work, developing civil affairs and human rights streams. It evolved to address unique vulnerabilities like sexual and gender-based violence. And now it's evolving again in the face of a global climate emergency, which will fuel future roles future wars and complicate our present situation. But what does this mean in brass tactics for peacekeeping operations and the leadership of both the Department of Peace Operations and to troop contributing countries? We must come up with the tools that troops and civilian blue berets need. I would imagine this includes, for example, capacity for risk assessment, closer cooperation between peacekeeping and the development and climate parts of the system, UN and beyond the UN. Feedback loops, because a lot of what the peacekeepers may see on the ground that needs doing, they can't do themselves. They need feedback loops that reach into other parts of the global system that can respond. And of course, rapid response, because the risks of climate change can, can meet us very, very suddenly. 
and UN peacekeeping missions sometimes have to spring into action. For example, in Haiti, they had to include the whole issue of recovery and reconstruction uh, from the 2010 earthquake when it hit. Finally, I think we need to acknowledge that all parts of the peace, humanitarian and development nexus have a role to play in confronting <clears throat> the juggernaut risk of climate change. That doesn't mean that UN peacekeeping missions must do all the work or even most of it, no. It means simply that the missions become better at anticipating, analyzing, liaising with other parts of the international community with bigger climate and res environmental responsibilities and being able to effectively respond to climate induced emergencies when they arise. Once again, special thanks to USI, NUPI and CIPRI for organizing this workshop and for the very impressive speakers that you've lined up to address this issue. And let me conclude by expressing the UN's profound appreciation for India's contribution to UN peacekeeping so steadily after over so many, so many decades, and not just the contribution of troops, I must say, but also its intellectual contributions to UN peacekeeping. Thank you so much. Thank you, Renata. Uh, I don't want to elaborate on the issues which you have brought out, I think these will be addressed by the panelists uh, during the course of webinar. Uh, to set the ball rolling, now I'll call upon our moderator, Dr. Cedric, to start the sessions. Over to you, Dr. Cedric. Thank you, General Goswami, and uh, thank you very much to General Swarma and, and to Renata Desalien from uh, the resident coordinator in, in New Delhi to thank you so much for your, for your opening statements. And now we're getting to uh, the meat of our discussion. For the next 45 minutes, we're going to have uh, three presentations. Uh, the first uh, presentation uh, is going to be by Dr. Manish Srivastava uh, from the Terry School of Advanced Studies. He's going to talk about climate change and conflict, uh, new challenges for peace and security. So, uh, after Dr. Manish, we'll have Dr. Florian Kramper and Major General Bardalai. But first, uh, let's go to Dr. Manish. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Cedric, and uh, thank you to organizers for giving me uh, this opportunity uh, to think about a topic which is, uh, I must confess, uh, not my uh, primary area of research. For uh, most of my academic career, I have focused on climate uh, negotiations and governance of climate change. Uh, so uh, looking uh, at the uh, interlinkages between climate change and, and peace uh, uh, keeping missions uh, is, is something uh, new and uh, interesting uh, uh, for me. So thank you for opening up that or pushing me to, to think in, in these new uh, uh, direction. Um, and, uh, well, the, the part is that, that my, my thought process is, is shaped by, uh, the global negotiations process. And that would be, uh, that has a greater bearing on what I'm going to, uh, say, and I must say, acknowledge at the, at, uh, right at the beginning that, uh, uh, the bearing uh, of, of my research as well as the uh, broader orientation of the organization that I have worked with, uh, have been working with, uh, that looks at everything from the governance of uh, and the future and feasibility of sustainable development uh, point of view. So, so, so my thoughts are, are geared uh, uh, towards that direction. Um, and that's why I, I, I when, when, the, the, when I was asked to choose uh, the topic, I, it, I, I decided to look at the uh, relationship between climate change and conflict rather than looking at directly from the peacekeeping uh, missions uh, point of view. And a uh, good part of what I'm going to say is actually built uh, on, on the insights that I developed while uh, supervising a, a master's thesis of a student of mine who, uh, who, who was on leave from the Indian Armed Forces and had a, a, a large experience of working in, in, in conflict areas and disaster risk relief programs. 
So um, I'm, I'm going to um, make a couple of uh, broad points uh, and they may not necessarily be flowing from one to another, but I'll try to wrap up uh, all of them together uh, in, 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 at the end. My, the, the first thing that, that, that comes to my mind, and I think it is very important, uh, is the commonality between the sources of conflict and climate risk. Um, other than, of course, the, the, the natural uh, exposure, the other uh, uh, sources of conflict and climate risk are fairly common. They involve uh, lack of development. If there is uh, lack of development and, and the, the massive competition uh, or fears of, of having a dignified life, then it is a very potential source of conflict. And it makes you extremely vulnerable to climate-induced risks. It enhances your vulnerability. It weakens your, your resilience uh, capacity. The second most important uh, part uh, aspect is is that uh, in in both areas where climate risks are high and where conflicts are continuing or or they are likely to occur, they all uh, suffer from uh, extremely poor uh, governance capacity. The governments or the local institutions or the organizations of government, including even civil society. Uh, uh, role is, is, is very weak, their capacities are severely undermined. Uh, they, they could be because of, of lack of technical skills or, or lack of resources, or even, even lack of ethical uh, um, integrity of, of the people uh, uh, constituting those organizations. Uh, aligned theme, uh, is the scarcity of resources, resource conflicts, and uh, resources and uh, access to resources has has been an important uh, 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 marker of of uh, the context of conflict, as well as the degree to which uh, uh, a community or a region uh, is is capable to to adapt to climate risks or not. And most importantly, in, in both cases, when, when we're talking in the context of UN peacekeeping uh, missions or the role of you know, organizations, and, and when both climate risks as well as conflicts involve transboundary actors, then it's also, then both of them are also a result of diplomatic uh, failures. And I think the new challenges that climate change introduces in, in conflict areas or, or our approach to dealing with conflicts uh, has to, uh, to, to, to emerge from, uh, uh, from these uh, common uh, 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 features uh, of both uh, conflict and climate risk. So that's the, the, the first uh, premise uh, of, of, of what uh, uh, I'm going to say. Uh, and the second premise, or rather assertion, uh, uh, that that I'm going to build on is the idea of peace as uh, one of the important sustainable development goals. And that the moment we th begin to think about peace as as a sustainable development goal uh, in the intertemporal uh, terms, in terms of intergenerational as well as intergenerational terms. Uh, it becomes very clear that peace is, is not just absence of or a controlled conflict, uh, and that, which practically implies that when we are thinking about challenges to peace, then we have to see it from a broader perspective instead of a limited perspective of peacekeeping uh, missions. I think uh, peacekeeping, in fact, should be seen in the context of larger imperatives of peace as sustainable development goal, an integral component of human uh, well-being. And uh, what naturally follows in my mind uh, from this uh, assertion is the fact is 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 uh, 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 is the proposition that we need to be cautioned against militarizing climate change. Uh, and instead should focus on the demilitarized role of peacekeeping missions 
that they can play, they have been playing in the conflict areas. Uh, so building on, on these two, and let me try to elaborate a little bit on what I think uh, is the demilitarized role of peacekeeping missions and why it is such an important aspect uh, from the perspective of, of, of governance uh, where I come from. Uh, the, the most important feature that needs underlining is the fact that the missions in the conflict areas are the most institutionalized organizations. And that is something uh, uh, that needs to be diffused in the conflict areas, institutionalization, institutional capacity to deal with uh, issues that are at the root of, of conflict. Uh, and, and, and that is something uh, that requires trust. And, and ironically, it, 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 the, the, uh, the ironical thing about uh, peacekeeping missions is that uh, a mission is successful in my view when, when the mission becomes irrelevant in a, in a conflict areas. And that can come only by uh, uh, establishing institutional mechanism and trust among the local stakeholders. And that from the both climate change point of view, building climate resilience to climate change uh, risks, as well as uh, uh, moderating, if not eliminating uh, conflict, uh, it becomes important to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, how to adapt to the constraints that give birth to conflicts and uh, that exacerbate uh, climate risk. Uh, I think, uh, a, one very good example in this direction uh, at the macro level at the least is, is the target that the UN has uh, set up for itself in terms of resource efficiency and use, where uh, an 80% renewable energy uh, uh, use for energy consumption of peacekeeping missions by 2030 that has been, it, it, uh, uh, I think a great deal, a, a, a good amount of transparency and disclosure on that, how it is being achieved, and how uh, the local actors are 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 uh, involved in it, can can actually go a long way in in achieving the objective of of peacekeeping missions, and these uh, uh, involvement of local actors can in 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 in. Uh, providing these uh, uh, or exposing uh, them to, to such uh, interventions uh, uh, could, could be a uh, founding uh, uh, stone or a stepping stone for uh, cooperation and, and uh, trust building. Um, so that's the second part. Uh, the, the third part that I want to talk about, uh, and that's the last one, is I think uh, the, the objective of peace has a lot to learn uh, from uh, the, the negotiations and agreements uh, in climate change. I know that uh, there are many who would frown uh, upon the progress and or the, they would blame that the, the progress in climate change negotiations and action has been very slow. But one, we should recognize that given the diversity of interest groups and capacities and, and uh, uh, mis the, 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 the climate of mistrust within which climate negotiations started, we have come a long way. And two things that have really defined the, the, the agreements in, in climate change negotiations are one, uh, the precautionary principle. So, uh, being careful uh, and knowing in advance what might lie ahead in future, what the risks are, is very important. So when it comes to conflict and uh, climate change overlaps, I think early warnings of both. What type of climate risks are we looking at in the conflict areas, but also what new types of conflicts that climate risks can induce in the areas which are not currently conflict areas. That understanding, that preparatory work is extremely important for, for uh, uh, peace. And, and, and I, I must remind again that when I say peace, I speak of it in terms of an SDG and not, not the absence of conflict alone. 
And the second, uh, so other than the precautionary principle, uh, the other uh, founding pillar uh, of, of climate agreement is uh, the, the promise and action on cooperation and partnerships. And again, we can learn a few things uh, from what's happening on climate uh, change front. Uh, I think collaborative research and action on climate risks can create conditions for peace or avoid future conflicts, or at least initiate the platforms on which trust can be built. Um, one example from, from Indian subcontinent, I think, is uh, uh, the organization called ECMOD, uh, which is an intergovernmental organization uh, uh, involving researchers from all uh, South Asian countries, which are one way or other part of the Himalayan ecosystem, working on climate change impacts in the region, right? social and economic uh, 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 implications. And that uh, spirit of collaboration can, can be an important aspect in future to build solidarities and, and find common resolution to conflicts. The second element of cooperation, of course, is, as, as what uh, I think Renata already mentioned, is the issue of capacity building, uh, cooperation, and assistance between uh, countries and actors. And in that direction, I think the, we should think of the role of UN agencies beyond UN uh, Security Council. Um, and there, I think if, if uh, the UN agency, UN as a system uh, uh, thinks of, of prevention of conflict who gives priority to prevention of conflict over intervention in conflict, that would be most important uh, 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 strategy uh, in future. Uh, for example, let's say climate-induced migration, uh, uh, while the scientists can, be, can, uh, can debate about attribution, but it is a problem and it is going to be a problem uh, uh, um, of transboundary nature. But before we hand it over to peacekeeping missions, uh, the other relevant UN bodies, including the Framework Convention on Climate Change, need to, to, to uh, address it. And this leads to my few recommendations, if I can call them at that at this point, at this such macro level of thought, uh, is uh, I, what I think that the new challenges for peace and security in conflict areas are essentially the challenges of framing of the problem, how we frame it. And in my view, it should be framed essentially a cooperation for sustainable development issue. And this then leads us to an another challenge and most important one is the uh, design of coordination between UN agencies and local agencies. Most importantly, how Security Council, UNDP, UNEP, Human Rights Commissions, and Framework Convention on Climate Change. How do they converse with each other? What type of agenda they push forward uh, collectively? That is going to be important. Uh, uh, and the third aspect there is, uh, as I said, the precaution is, is a key but uh, we do not know what exact nature of precaution and early warning in the areas which could potentially become conflict prone due to climate change is. So defining and operationalizing uh, precaution in, in, is, is in, at the overlap of conflict and climate change is, uh, uh, is very important. I, at this point, I'm of the opinion that this is it is important to focus on the future because the current missions, uh, existing missions, they suffer from the stickiness of current engagement. They are entangled in uh, various uh, 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 problems. So uh, perhaps a new approach for future uh, would be more uh, efficient and effective. And that leads to me, uh, leads me to a question that I would want to uh, finish my talk with. Uh, and I wonder, whether uh, 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 Cedric mentioned that uh, Norway had uh, pushed uh, climate change agenda in the UN, uh, Security Council, but in the same meeting, the, the India was very cautious 
in, in uh, incorporating uh, that uh, agenda. And that's where the, I want to propose whether the reverse is possible in the sense that would it be possible that the members of UN Security Council form a, a kind of negotiating block under the framework convention of climate change and they push for comprehensive action and cooperation on climate change from the perspective of not only avoiding climate risks, but political conflicts as well. And at the top of this agenda is the issue of loss and damage and uh, uh, issue of climate induced uh, refugees. Uh, I think that that that's, that these are my my you know initial thoughts, random thoughts, and I would be happy to uh, engage uh, more on these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Manish. Uh, that was a, a really uh, um, good overview and very interesting and useful points that I think you've contributed to the debate. Um, I mean, I think amongst others, uh, the focus on the uh, and the issues beyond hard security, seeing peace, not just as, as the absence of violence, but as an, a critical element of sustainable development goals. Uh, and therefore the peace, humanitarian development nexus approach uh, is, is something that I think is, is, is really important. Um, as is your point, uh, very interesting about what we can learn from the climate negotiations uh, and the issues you raised there around the participatory principle, partnerships and cooperation. So I, I look forward to, to us engaging with those issues. Uh, just to remind our participants, so we're going to have uh, two more speakers uh, and then we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. So please do feel free to, to pose any questions you may have in the chat function uh, so that the panelists can start uh, thinking about those. So next uh, on our list is Dr. Florian Kramper from CIPRI. Uh, Florian, uh, you have the screen. Thank you so much, Cedric. Uh, thank you, colleagues. And, and also from CIPRI side, it's a great pleasure and honor to, to co-host this um, session with all of you. I think this is a really important topic um, that we have worked on, on for some time. Um, I, I will be brief in my remarks um, and, and specifically focus on peace building. Just as a background, my name is Florian Kramper. I'm a senior researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and I'm a program director of their climate change and risk program. Um, I've worked on the subject the last 10 years uh, at the interlinkage of environmental security, climate security and, and peace building. And um, of course now, now most recently in the role at CPRI with that. Um, I wanted to kick us off with, with um, just a brief reflection. And I think that relates to, to some of the co uh, uh, comments that were made just before me. Um, I think what research is showing us increasingly is that the human security risks of today um, are becoming increasingly the hard security risks of tomorrow. What is different and what is interesting and noteworthy is that there are no hard security solutions to that. Um, <clears throat> what that means is that climate change and its impact that it has on, on um, peace and security and the geographies uh, that are specifically affected is changing the security landscape as we know it. And with that, it is changing the requirements for building peace. Um, the resident coordinator was so kind to refer to our data. And I think um, while, while um, Manish was absolutely right in, in raising that, that something is different and, and um, uh, raising the question around the Security Council, is a relevant um, um, discussion to be had. Um, but I think the numbers that, that um, uh, Renata was, was referring to, to were, were very clearly showing us why, among others, climate security is an issue for the Security Council. If six of the 10 biggest peace operations are in hot climate security hotspots, um, it is, it is uh, an issue for the Security Council. And just to put that into, into a different number, it is 80% of all currently deployed peacebuilding and uh, or peacekeeping and special political mission personnel 
um, that is in areas highly affected by climate change. Considering that India, is, as General Sharma was pointing out at the beginning, is, is um, the second largest uh, contributor to, to peace building, peacekeeping and peace building efforts, I think this also has a specific relevance for, for India. Um, I want to speak very briefly on, on the, some of the key findings from our uh, research. Um, we have looked specifically at peace operations, um, both special political missions and peacekeeping operations, to ask the question, how is climate change and the impact that climate change has on society affecting these peace operations in their work? How it is affecting specifically their mandate? And with a second question, how are these missions responding to, to these increasing challenges? Um, I will focus on three specific impacts. The first one is on peace and security. The second one is on governance and state building. And the third one is on development and humanitarian um, aspects. All, all three are, are in, in different ways, elements of, of most peace operation mandates. So, so I think that those are relevant categories that um, uh, allow us to get a broader overview of the uh, issue. Um, at the end, I will briefly outline um, some of the initial responses and some of the recommendations that we have. Moving on to the first one, the impact of climate uh, on peace and security. I found it really interesting and I was actually surprised in the first study we did one and a half years ago on, on um, the mission in, in, in Somalia. Um, how substantive the impact was on the peace and security aspect of, of the mandate. We see climate change impacting DDR programming and security sector reform at large, not least through increasingly providing a fertile ground for recruitment. Not to simplify that story, recruitment into, into um, uh, rebel and, and terrorist groups is a, is a uh, multifaceted aspect, but we see increasingly how climate change is, is uh, contributing to livelihoods deterioration that is contributing to recruitment um, in, in these groups. We see also very significantly an impact on the operational readiness of peace operations, on logistics and the mobility of, of military actors as such. Um, no, one, one key aspect here, in, in we see that both in Somalia, we see that in Mali and, and, and other cases, um, increased flooding is, is, is inhibiting military actors from, from, from moving to the, to the um, areas that they need to move to, for example, uh, in the frame of protection of civilians. Um, we see how increased sandstorms are, are challenging the surveillance activities um, that, that missions need to run to secure compounds, um, etc. I think these are very significant impacts and, and we see them very clearly in, in both, for example, in, in Mali and, and in Somalia, but also in other cases. Moving on to the impacts on governance and state building. And here it gets on the one hand interesting, but it also gets a little bit more, more uh, complicated and indirect in the linkages. We see increasingly that um, climate impacts on these countries and, and the dynamics that ensue are undermining the legitimacy of state building efforts. One of the key aspects of peace operations um, is of course the state building um, efforts as, as was referred to before. Ideally we're moving towards a space where the peace operation is not necessary anymore <clears throat> and the state um, can, can handle um, the peace and security affairs um, itself. But we're seeing increasingly that these efforts are undermined by the impacts of climate change. Both on the one hand, with states lacking the capacity um, to provide important livelihood services to communities, increasing the grievances among the population um, against state actors and thereby opening the floor for other actors. But also uh, in an interesting twist, it allows insurgent groups to capitalize on the absence of the state and be the service provider itself. We see that in, in a lot of cases, and I think one of the um, uh, very notable ones uh, uh, quite some, uh, well, a couple of years ago was, was with floods in Pakistan, um, where the Taliban were essentially the first actor on the ground. Um, 
Another aspect here in the governance and state building front that we haven't anticipated and that, that our research in Somalia showed um, as one of the first as, as a problem is that it undermines existing peace agreements. Not the big peace agreements in itself, but also smaller power sharing agreements that are put in place by the UN. <clears throat> one example in Somalia is the city of Baidoa. Um, which through the influx of, of IDPs that were displaced through increased flooding and, and, and uh, drought events in the region, um, the city grew and the ethnic composition of the, of the city changed. Well, the UN had just before put a power sharing agreement in place in that city that was based on ethnic lines. Um, with a change of the demographic composition, this power sharing agreement was under threat. It raises the question how climate proof are actually our, our peace agreements in this context and how can we actually adapt to this uncertainty? Moving from the impacts on governance and state building to the impacts on development and humanitarian issues, um, maybe, maybe an area where people more immediately locate impacts of climate security. Also here we see specific impacts on, um, on, on peace operations mandates. Um, we see an increased risk of sexual and gender-based violence. While um, for example, in Somalia, the mission explicitly has a mandate in, in, in addressing and reducing that risk. Um, but simply because of the livelihood deterioration, the changing patterns um, of everyday life, and the need to, to uh, move to different areas through hurdles, uh, or, or lo longer, longer um, ways to, to collect water and, and um, longer, longer ways to, to adequate grazing grounds, we see an increased risk both for women, um, young children, but also for men to be exposed to sexual and gender-based violence. <clears throat> A side effect of the displacement here is also a feminization of villages, which on the one hand, again, increases the risks and, and the vulnerability, but actually it also opens up opportunities for empowerment and, and um, developments that, that are interestingly to uh, look more into and, and explore. Um, in sum, we see impacts across peace operations mandates. We actually just um, 20 minutes ago published a study on, on MINUSMA, so I'm happy to share that in the link and please have a look and, and look that up. Um, <clears throat> While we see these impacts, missions have responded, and I don't think I have much time to go into, into detail um, to that. Just want to raise maybe one, one example that relates um, to, the, to the coordination aspect that was also raised before. The drought operation coordination centers in Somalia were a response of a failed response to drought uh, in, in, in um, uh, 2011. Uh, in, in, in later years, uh, when, when a new famine and, and drought was uh, or drought uh, was was um, ongoing and a famine was on the agenda um, to to be there, um, the mission introduced drought operation coordination centers, which are active efforts to bring together the UN, um, the special political mission UNSOM, um, the UN country team with all its UN agencies and um, civil society, government, and other international organizations to coordinate the response around, um, uh, around the drought. And um, in, in a, without highlighting this as the solution, um, I think the, the um, efforts were quite, quite successful in, in um, not uh, or in preventing a, a major famine. Moving on um, and wrapping up with, with some recommendations. Um, we need more training. We don't need to make every peacekeeping and, and peace building um, actor and, and, and uh, deployed personnel a peace climate security expert, but we need to increase the sensibility um, of these actors to understand how climate related security risks are affecting their work, how it is undermining the work, um, and given their expertise, I'm pretty confident that that already in itself will, will spark thinking to change um, and, and uh, respond differently and think about alternative solutions. Um, for that, we need, we need to increase training. 
The second part is we need to institutionalize the role of an environmental security advisor, or more specifically, ideally a climate security advisor in peace operations that are in climate hotspots. Um, this person can, on the one hand, coordinate um, these efforts within the mission, it can facilitate the training efforts, and it can um, uh, uh, synthesize and, 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 and channel the right information to the right parts of the mission um, to, to increase uh, awareness and understanding of that. Lastly, I want to raise uh, the, 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 the last point, and, and typically what we, what we hear in the space is, um, well, now we also need to do climate, right? And actually, I, I disagree. Because if you think about what responses to climate security actually entail, also in the framework of a peace operation, it is actually an opportunity. Because a lot of the things that we need to do for climate adaptation and, and climate mitigation in these, these areas are actually development programs. They're actually peace building programs. We just need to understand that they are. We need to identify the opportunities and the synergies that are there. Um, uh, around issues of res natural resource governance and, and, and things like that to move on to, to um, a more positive framing and, and, and opportunities that bring development, uh, inclusive development into the discourse. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. I, I think that was very useful to, to share the uh, insights uh, that you've gained from your research and to highlight how um, climate change is having an impact on, on peace operations and on peace building and development in the various ways that, that you've done. We're going to turn now to Major General Bardelai. Uh, Major General Bardelai is also a scholar and uh, uh, he will defend his uh, PhD dissertation in July, so we wish him well. Uh, and in the meantime, we will listen to, to uh, his thoughts on India's experiences uh, with the impact of climate change on peace operations. So screen is yours, uh, General Badalai. Thank you, Dr. Cedric and all the participants. And thanks to my two previous speakers. And firstly, I endorsed everything what you say. So I'll come down to the operational level. You know, when the peacekeepers get deployed in the conflict zones, they're seen as the saviors by the local population. They think that they are the angels of God, then expect them to pull them out of the miseries. So whenever the local population get into any kind of problem, whether they're hungry, they need medical care, or the security reason, the peacekeeping base in the conflict zone becomes the, the first stop. Now the expectations for the uniform man is the same across everywhere in the world. In India too, we occasionally rise, the uniform people, when any calamity, a disaster management, go out of the, not jurisdiction, the civil administration is not capable of handling this. The impact of climate change can affect the local populations in the conflict zone also. The question is that the same uniform people are they ready to respond equally when they're deployed outside their countries in the peace, as peacekeepers? Now, answer to this, to find to answer to this, I think we have to ask four more questions. The first is that, is the peacekeeping mission or operation, whatever way you want to call it, are adequately resourced? Then finally, the peacekeepers, are they prepared to take that extra risk that may be associated in providing assistance to the local population. Third, is the mission mandated? And fourth, are the peacekeepers prepared in terms of training and the willingness to do the thing? Now, normally, most of the peacekeeping operations are self-sustained administratively in terms of engineering for construction of their assets, on mission support, that medical care, um, communication, and air mobility. But such resources are finite numbers. Therefore, the most of the peacekeeping missions are either not adequately resourced to handle calamity of the larger scale, or they are not prepared to face the challenges of impact of the climate change 
when it comes to implementing the mandate of the pieces really or security related issues. Now, peacekeepers always help the local population when they need. And when they extend a helping hand, these also help the peacekeepers to gain local trust from the local population. But the response of the peacekeepers, anyone in the conflict zones, the need of the local population will depend on the associated risk involved in extending such help. Therefore, impact of the climate change on the peace operations will vary from one conflict to another. Now, that does not mean that when there is a need, peacekeepers turn a blind eye to need of the local population. Now, I'll put across the Indian perspective, firstly, drawing example from the two peacekeeping operation, contemporary peace operation, that is in South Sudan, there's the experience of the peacekeeper in the South Sudan. Second is the fear of the experience, what the peacekeepers might have to go through in DRC. Third issue, of course, I'd like to flag the general thought of the Indian peacekeepers about the impact of climate change as such. Coming to the, uh, this UNMIS, that is South Sudan, since the core objective of the peace operation is uh, protection of the civilian population, most of the operational activities are related to peace and security. When, but because of the climate change and because of the extreme drought and flooding conditions, it forced large scale migration of the local population. And they not only relocate themselves within South Sudan, also there are times they try to move from South Sudan to Sudan. And such migrating local population often harassed and blackmailed by the corrupt security forces. And at that point of time, protecting such section of the local population gets a better priority for the peacekeeping operations in the South Sudan. There are times then the such migrating population also come in the crossfire of the rival gangs, armed gangs were fighting among themselves. There are instances, there attempt of hungry population, whether migrating or not, trying to rob the even uh, World Food Program granary. At that time, protection of the stores, its workers, and UN and non-UN workers were related to humanitarian work becomes a priority of for these UN peacekeepers. So a sizable force is diverted in such cases for protection duties. So protection of the civilians take a different dimension. Now, when the rival gangs fight among themselves, in the strong even patrol, well armed and well equipped is not strong enough and deterrence does not work. And the worst is if the fighting armed groups decide to train their guns on the peacekeepers, then use of force in self-defense also become questionable. Next issue is that there are times when the peacekeepers help a community purely out of their own resources on humanitarian ground. At that point of time, the such humanitarian act of the peacekeepers are seen as a parcel by other party. So what happened? Largely, these are not the only issues. I'm just highlighting all these issues. There's a climate change impact in a manner, the large scale migration of populations where protection of civilian become a slightly more complex. Principles of peacekeeping operations that use of force in self-defense and status of impersonality come under question. And also it become difficult to peacekeepers to find ways and means to help these people. Now, it is uh, I know, to address such challenges, obviously it come at the cost of uh, the primary mandated task. Now, South Sudan, there are a number of camps where civilian population is guarded. One of the option, it has to be checked or verified, examined, that these camps can be temporarily considered as temporary shelter for the migrating population. 
Now, as far as drought and flooding is concerned, it is not that dry, the Nile River dries up completely. The wealthier population who stay next to the river banks, they continue to draw water during drought seasons. And even during flooding, they have got where we to survive through the disasters. It is only the poor local civilians who stay in the hinterland and do not have the resource to cope with the problem of drought and flooding are forced to migrate. Therefore, some of the peace building activities, which has been highlighted by Dr. Florian earlier, if help the local migrating populations to stay put in the same places, a bit, little bit of assistance, it will address the core problem. Let me now come back to DRC. Firstly, the health hazard. It is known to everyone. Only point I want to touch about of the health hazard in DRC is that while the pandemic, current pandemic has affected all peace operators in one way or the other, I have spoken to one peacekeeper who recently returned from Congo. He said this pandemic has not impacted the peace operation in Congo as it is feared to be. It is because the internal communication network in Kia DRC is so poor that by default, villagers have to maintain large social distance. So much so for the health hazard. I don't want to go beyond this point. But yet the another hazard is waiting in Congo. I'm referring to famous Niara Congo volcano, which is located 20 kilometers north of Eastern town of Goma of the DRC. It's erupted already 34 times since 1882. And when it erupted in 1994, the last time, the 13 kilometers distance space opened up in a southern slope that faces the Goma town. Lava flowed right up to northern part of the Goma town and reached Lake Kivu. Law, hundreds of people died and thousands had to be evacuated. Now, Lake Kivu, this is on the other side of the Goma town. This is known for one of the three famous lakes which has got excessive deposit of carbon dioxide and methane gas. About, I believe it is about 300 billion cubic meters of carbon dioxide and 60 billion of methane gas. And because of the chemical process, the carbon dioxide gas get converted to methane gas. It becomes a potential hazard. Now, this one, I believe now I've been, methane gas has been harnessed by a power project and they're converting this methane gas to the convertible electrical energy. So far, so good. But I am slightly worried to imagine a situation when, if the climate change can trigger the Niara Congo Volpo again, and this time lava does not remain or at the stop at the outskirt of Goma. It covers a larger part of the Goma town and enters Lake Kivu, forcing the methane gas to rise up in the air. At that point of time, that the local population is about more than 5 million local population in Guma town. Would they be able to protect themselves? Or they will come looking for help to the peacekeeping base, which is there in Goma town, about 10,000 peacekeepers. And what do the peacekeepers do? Do they deny it because not mandated? Or they activate only plan which is available to MONOSCO, the evacuation plan an evacuation plan, ladies and gentlemen, not for the civilian population. It is for the even person. I think we have to answer this four question, which I had brought up again. Now looking at the enormity of challenges. So before that, I must say there must be there for contingency plan. What is required is that firstly, we have to accept that there is a problem. And after accepting the problem, we should recognize and correctly identify the problem. But there must be a serious commitment, willingness by the member states that there is a problem we have to collectively contribute and allow their peacekeepers to contribute. Because unless the member states are willing to do that, whether a peace mission is mandated or not, peacekeepers will look back towards the national capital 
asking for clarification whether it is what risking their life or not. Third, the peacekeepers have been trained and well equipped. And when I say trained and well equipped, the training has to be case by case basis. The peacekeepers were deployed in Congo, trained for a situation because of volcano or methane gas, cannot be applied, flown to, of course, South Sudan to deal with that. So the case by case, and that can only happen if a proper field report is available, comprising a team of experts, and also it includes the peacekeepers from the global north. Why I'm telling you, I'll come to you later, because they are the people belong to the member states who can make the difference in the when the disaster comes. Yeah, no, after doing... So sorry. Um, if you could um, uh, just maybe sum up for us, because we are running a bit out of time. I'll just finish with uh, two minutes, promise. Okay. Now, last point my, I want to highlight is that there's a, it has been spoken about these peacekeepers' contrib negative contributions. I am, it is very true. I don't want to dwell on it because I think SIPRI paper and papers written by NUPI is uh, exhausting enough. All I want to say, peacekeepers, if sensitized, I think and they can contribute in reducing the footprint. But what troubling the TCC of the global south is that while the climate change topic is very important, this is not the only issues. Reason being, impact of the climate change on the peace operations are not much of different for the other impacts of the challenges of the what the TCC of the global south and highlighting from time to time. That is one. So and unfortunately, that in the most conflict, intense conflict area where the peacekeepers take part, today Indian peacekeepers, of course, one of those, those are either uh, violence intense or conflict infected, or sorry, they're climatically affected. Now, in this area, what happens? The peacekeepers of the these nations become the victim first. My question is that what happened? If these are to be considered the first responders, they become the victim. So therefore, I would suggest that while we must stress on the subject of importance of the climate change, we got to have a balanced stress. Reason being, had we that we listen to the points or recommendation given by these major TCCs earlier, most of the problem of the impact of the climate change on the peace operation would have been addressed earlier. To wrap it up, I would say to brave the challenges, there must be a growing awareness commitment from, uh, from the permanent or members of the security, permanent security council and the powerful members and not get carried away by the selective inputs by the, some of the journalists who prefer to highlight only the negative part of the peacekeeping contributions, but keep quiet on what they have been able to achieve or not and want to cut down the peacekeeping budgets. And then, Peacekeepers obviously cannot keep quiet when it comes to save, serving human population, whether it's meant or not. But to achieve that, it must be a collective responsibility from the entire international community and cannot be left to the troop contributing countries from the global south alone. Thank you, Dr. Sadhu. Thank you very much, uh, General Badalai. Uh, that was uh, really interesting. Uh, many of the aspects you raised are uh, very topical and relevant and important questions that we need to consider uh, when addressing this topic. I'm afraid uh, all of us uh, took a bit longer than, than we anticipated. So we have now, unfortunately, maybe 10 minutes at most for discussion. So I'm going to ask uh, those of you who would like to take the floor to please raise your hands please be as uh, concise as possible. And uh, most probably we will not have time for the panelists to, to reply. So rather than comments, focus on, on your own contribution or, or, or so rather than questions, focus on comments or your own contribution that you may have. So we also have a number of questions uh, raised in the chat function. So please have a look at that and also engage with, with those questions. But um, is there anyone who would like to, to take the floor and, and make a comment? You can raise your hand, which uh, you'll see at the bottom of the screen for those of you on the Zoom call. Um, at the bottom of the screen, next to a uh, number of the other menu items, there, there's one item raise hand. If there's no one, I hope I didn't scare you off now by uh, stressing so much out that we have limited time. 
Um, but um, is there any of the panelists who would like to respond to some of the questions that have been raised in the chat function? Yeah, Dr. Cedric, the one question raised by Lara Krosik. Uh, I'm glad that she rose it. Yes, peacekeepers, I will not say to some extent, the large extent responsible for the negative contributions. The way our construction work come up, the way they lead their day to day life, I don't highlight. Simple example, I can say the construction work haphazardly comes up, the garbage disposal, and 24 hour generators running in the area that can be polluted. They're going careless, they stay for six months and come back. I think a great deal can be done if you think about it. I think another question came up that I will connect these questions. I think rather than the leaving this for the training by the environmentalists in the peacekeeping mission, these are to be best trained by it in the home country. Because I have seen the peacekeeping mission, not only the number of advisors, general advisor, environmental advisor, HIV advisor, but the peacekeeping, the conditions don't listen, to be very, very honest. They don't listen and they'll keep taking lecture knowledge. So that has to come from the within, from the heart. And this has to be trained and monitored from the home country rather. Because you see the way the peacekeeping is a part of the political work, this is to force come on the head of the missions, you'll be very, he will also pass diplomatic orders, come from there. But the last it can be done, you have can go green, garbage disposal can be done, communications. I think the mobile cars are now, it create a lot of hazards. Construction work. Now, one of the report, I think from the NUPI or the CIPRI has suggested that we deployment must be based on, yes, should be. But point is that we have to understand that the deployment in the peacekeeping operation primarily has to be operational. So after having identified certain operation, we must think about it, how best we can do that. I would say enough can be done, but not enough has been done. Thank you so much, General Badala. And I, I think your point about the ownership that the troop contributing countries uh, need to take and that they, the influence they can have is, is of course critical. But uh, the role of advisors and missions are of course, not only to you know, play a role in, in advising to troop contributing countries, but especially in the planning process, in the integrated planning process and to advise the civilian leadership is of course also critical. Uh, any one of the other panelists would like to make a comment or respond to one of the questions or some of the questions that have been raised? Then I want to uh, thank you very much for our panelists. Uh, I think you've made really a comprehensive uh, comments and thank you very much for our participants who have engaged so actively also in the, in the questions on the chat and please continue to do that. But I'm going to use now the opportunity to turn to uh, Rania Dagash, uh, who is representing the UN Department of Peace Operations. She happens to be uh, based at the moment in, in Nairobi, which means that it's not uh, three o'clock in the morning in New York or something for you, Rania. So that's fantastic. It means you could, you could join us. So please, uh, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric. And um, really, my thanks goes to USI India, Tanuki, and Cipri for this rich conversation today. To us, you're not just key partners in exploring some of the global trends that impact peacekeeping, but you're also partners in helping us to define and shepherd concrete solutions. And I think this conversation is, is, is really a great start to, to exactly that. Um, my reflections, Cedric, are really in, in three baskets. And the first is what we've agreed on today. Um, we agreed on five things, um, which in many ways uh, framed also what I was going to say. We know that climate change is here to stay. We know that it impacts all forms of human endeavor, and that includes peacekeeping. And that many of the countries uh, that are impacted by climate change are hosting our, our operations in Africa and the Middle East, especially. The third thing we know is that while climate change does not directly cause armed conflict, we do see a convergence. And it indirectly increases the risk of conflict by exacerbating the existing social, economic, and environmental factors. And often in contexts, as, as, as uh, many uh, eloquent speakers put it today, where weak state structures and governance struggle to respond to begin with. We also know um, and are responding to a lot of existing challenges that are integrated in climate change. 
So in many ways, a lot of this has already existed, but we also have a lot to learn because how climate is and may in the future impact our different contexts and dimensions of the work of peacekeeping specifically is probably something that we're still trying to adapt to and, and where the research uh, that Florian and others have done has been extremely eye-opening. The fifth thing that we also agreed on today is that it is a collective responsibility and it is a collaborative process. And I, we look at this in two ways, I think, in the department. At the mandate and policy level, where the Security Council responsibility in mandating is one, um, and how it needs to emphasize the prevention angle um, with the response angle and that the peace building and stronger governance and state building have to be integral to this. We look at it also at the ground level where our operations are running and our TCCs are, uh, and PCCs are working and, and the need to link and address the drivers of conflict to sustainable development. We agree um, and it's how, and I think we're extremely conscious as we look at the future of peacekeeping as well, about the importance of closing the gap between our operations and other UN actors, other civil society organizations, think tanks and NGOs, and communities on the ground. So I think we agree around these five very much. Well, the second part of, of what I, I thought to share is what we have heard from our missions and what we are adapting to. Um, we've heard from many national governments, particularly in the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa, that they are experiencing some of the most severe climate-related impacts, um, and, and many have elaborated on this. But these impacts and stresses act in turn to exacerbate the drivers of conflict and violence, and they undermine how the UN and other peacebuilding and conflict management efforts work. In Mali, in South Sudan, and in the Central African Republic, we've seen rising levels of intercommunal violence linked to farmer herder conflicts, as an example. And despite a history of managing such conflicts peacefully, um, some of these systems are breaking down. So it's not just the governments and the communities that have had to adapt, but peacekeeping as well. We've had to adjust. So our civil affairs officers, as an example, are working with national and, and regional authorities to mediate between farmers and, and um, herders. Some of the protection of civilian work that we do, there are many forward operating bases which have had to adjust to reflect the evolving patterns of cattle migration and potential hotspots. Um, with that, an adjustment in our patrols um, and while this isn't the case everywhere, it is really important for us to learn from and document these experiences in the field. It's really been uh, insightful to hear about India as, as, as our second um, largest contributor to peacekeeping and drawing on the experience from various missions and thinkers. So we, we are focused on improving our reporting to the Security Council in ways in which climate um, is impacting stability and ability of our missions to achieve their mandates. We have a PRST that member states have put out since 2011, actually, that requires us to do so. We are supporting host governments in the UN system as a whole in undertaking adequate risk assessments and management strategies. Um, the resolutions for MINUSMA, MINUSCA, even MINUSCO and UNMIS um, are testaments to that. But we also know that we need much stronger partnerships. Um, we know that our work with the African Union, EGAD, and other regional partners is really critical. Um, and that our work with the council even more so, including, of course, with India's role currently on the council. And in closing, I just want to say we do stand ready to work in three areas. In anticipating, and doing better contextual analysis and supporting our climate advisors and security advisors with the expertise needed to ensure this integration of context-specific risk analysis. We know that. And we know that that's a deficiency in our operations and it's an area we hope to use platforms like these and others to advocate that we are better equipped with. And I agree with you, uh, General AK, this isn't 
about just these um, climate security advisors. It's about improving our understanding at large in those missions. Um, now that's the anticipation, improving our understanding. The second is our planning. And, and to Lara and uh, Kritika's point in the chat, our operational planning and resilience of our missions also has to catch up. Studying how the climate related factors are adequately reflected in operational planning, in training and in equipping our missions and RT and PCCs is critical. This is the climate proofing that Florian was referring to earlier. So that helps us ensure political and operational resilience. It isn't just about operations because ultimately we are there to address political processes. And then finally, we are, we stand ready to work in the response to this. Um, and DOS has been the Department of Operational Support has been an outlier in the UN in trying to gear up mission support um, to reduce the UN's environmental footprint. Through increased use of renewable energies, whether they have done so with the flagships in Somalia, they're doing so with uh, South Sudan, with our two largest solar plants actually in peacekeeping, but growing and expanding that and the understanding of that is what we rely on many of you to also help us advocate for. I'll stop there, Cedric. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rania. That was uh, very useful to, to hear from, from you uh, how uh, the United Nations headquarters in New York, as well as uh, the missions in the field, see and deal with, with uh, um, the effects of climate change on peacekeeping. Uh, this has been a very rich uh, and comprehensive discussion. Thank you so much to all the panelists uh, and thank you for all the participants for joining us. Uh, for me, what stood out of, of this discussion was really the, the uh, acknowledgement by all of us that this is one of the issues we need to pay attention to. It doesn't mean it's the only issue or even the most important issue, but it is one of the issues that we need to address uh, uh, increasingly in the future. And that is why we are also focusing on it today. But I think as, as uh, Dr. Manish and others have mentioned, it's very important to have a comprehensive approach towards this problem, not to securitize uh, overly this, the, uh, the effects of climate change might have. And I think that is what many of you have highlighted. Uh, peacekeeping is such a partnership endeavor with troop contributing countries and member states that contribute finances and, and contribute to set uh, our direction in the Security Council and elsewhere. Um, and uh, with others of us, perhaps in the research and think tank community that contributes also to the knowledge of this effect. So it's really something that all of us need to be engaged in together. So for that, I, I, I thank all of you so much. And of course, especially uh, General Sharma and colleagues from USI India, thank you for the partnership and for co-hosting this event with us. Thanks, thanks a lot for being with us and look forward to more such opportunities. Thank you very much, Anu Sharma. Thank you very much, colleagues, and especially our panelists, uh, Renata, um, Rania, uh, General Badalai, Dr. Manish, Dr. Florian. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank, thank you. So you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.